Welcome back to the channel. There's a new study out now in Nature Communications and it's being featured in media outlets. It claims that COVID-19 vaccinations and dose after dose, including the booster, actually lower the risk of things like heart attacks and arterial clots like strokes. Is this a credible paper? Is it good science? Well, let's take a look in this video. So first of all, the title of the paper is called A Cohort Study of Cardiovascular Safety of Different COVID-19 Vaccination Doses Among 46 Million Adults in England. 46 million, that's a big number. But big data also can mean big, big problems, big residual confounding and big other problems. So this paper has got all the hallmarks of a big data set that's got a lot of big problems. One thing I got to say right off the bat, when you have very, very large data sets, you can find easily p-values that are extremely significant, p.0001. Finding these p-values is a triviality. Whether or not you're actually have your finger on a causal relationship, that's the real question in these papers. So this paper basically compares people who had no doses to people who got one dose, people who had one dose to people who had two doses. The first two doses, of course, is considered the primary vaccination series. If you've had two doses, did you get a booster versus if you didn't get a booster? It makes all these comparisons. And basically what they find is across the board, every additional dose you get, they think there's a lower risk of arterial clots and heart attacks and things like that. And that risk actually is even bigger the more doses you get. That's the main finding of the paper. That's what they're claiming. And there are people like Dr. Vin Gupta. Apparently Dr. Vin Gupta is an actual doctor who appears on NBC. And he writes, as others have noted, this type of result isn't what legions of white coats who continue to spread misinformation were hoping for. He says, real science published in the world's signature and most prestigious medical journal accountability is coming to the misinformer near you. That's what Vin Gupta writes. Apparently he's a, he's a doctor who's featured on NBC and MSNBC. Well, one interesting thing right off the bat is that this is in nature communications, not nature. And so when he says that this is the world's signature and most prestigious medical journal, I think he's confused nature with nature communications. That's a big difference. Okay, nature communications, it's like Bronny James. It's not LeBron, okay, it's Bronny. I mean, will he be great? Well, who knows, but it ain't LeBron, okay? I think Vin Gupta doesn't know this because Vin Gupta doesn't actually publish many research articles. I PubMed Vin Gupta and I didn't get a lot returned back. So I think he actually doesn't understand the publishing landscape. All right. He also doesn't understand this paper, which we're going to talk about. The paper has maybe three or four central problems with the paper. Let me tell you the first problem it has. The people who get one dose, two doses, three doses, and zero doses, it turns out they're not the same types of people. They're very different people. The authors make an attempt to acknowledge this in some of their tables. They have tables in the main manuscript and in the supplement that compare these populations. One thing right off the bat is they use something called the Societal Deprivation Index, an index in England, and they show that people who are unvaccinated scored higher on the deprivation. In other words, they came from places with more deprivation than people who got one dose or beyond. That was one of their first findings. So they have a higher societal deprivation index. They're also more likely to be current smokers, people who are unvaccinated. So smoking, of course, also has something to do with having heart attacks and arterial events. And being poor in socioeconomics has something to do with that as well. So the first question is, are they separating getting the COVID vaccine from the type of person, the wealthy, well-educated, obedient person who keeps getting dose after dose? And I think that's the first problem is that they haven't done a good job of that. And this is called residual confounding. When you have a data set that the group of people that didn't do something and the group that did do something are fundamentally different in ways beyond the thing that they did, you need to try to adjust for all those things. You can only adjust for things you measure. You can't adjust for things you don't measure. And there's so many things they didn't measure here, okay? There are ways you can check to see if you've achieved balance, which I'll talk about in a minute. Even if you compare people who've gotten two doses and the booster versus those who didn't get the booster, there are still differences. There's a difference in the rate, particularly among those who got mRNA boosters versus the people who just got two doses, no booster in the societal deprivation index. I took a little bit of a dive into the societal deprivation index and I see it's just a very shitty index. I mean, it's a map of the UK and they have little patches that say this is deprived, this is not deprived. The reason I call that shitty is that on the same block, there can be rich people, rich people and poor people. This treats them all equally as long as they live on that block. Of course, some blocks are rich blocks and some blocks are poor blocks, but there's also variation within blocks and it doesn't capture that. A good way to do this would be to actually have the household income or the household wealth and use that as a variable in your regression analysis or your Cox regression, which is what they do. 
I should say. The researchers are doing something called a Cox regression, which is basically looking for the effect of each additional dose on these outcomes they care about, which is 11 cardiovascular outcomes, adjusting for the other things that they have in the data set, but not adjusting for the things that they don't have in their data set, which is probably a lot of things. Okay, so problem one is, this to me smells like it has a lot of residual confounding. There are things they could do to prove to me that doesn't exist, which we'll talk about in problem three. They don't do that. Problem two, imagine there's two people, there's Bob and Tom, and both Bob and Tom are planning on getting the booster next Monday, okay? This is Saturday when I'm recording. They're planning on getting the booster on Monday. On Sunday, unfortunately, Bob wakes up and he has a massive heart attack you would imagine that his plans might be dashed. He's not going to be able to make it to get his booster on Monday, and only Tom can make it to get his booster on Monday. So which category does Bob go in? He goes in the group of people who didn't get a booster. You see, this is a problem with their, with their whole data analysis, is that these events that they're talking about, these arterial clots, these are life-disrupting events. Stroke is a disrupting event. MI is a disrupting event. When you experience these events, you're probably much less likely to go to CVS, wherever the hell they do it in the UK, and get your booster because you're dealing with some big event that happened in your life. That means people who experience the big event before they get the shot will only be put in the bucket of people who didn't get the shot. In epidemiology, we call this immortal time or guarantee time. It's a subset of time zero problems. It basically means that people who got the booster were guaranteed something that people who didn't get the booster weren't guaranteed. They were guaranteed that they did well enough so that their plans to get the booster could occur. This doesn't mean the booster prevented them from getting a heart attack, but that if you had a heart attack, you couldn't get a booster. And this immortal time is baked into their whole study. And I don't see how they get around it. I don't see how they're solving this problem. Okay. Number three, there's a way that you could prove to me that you've solved the immortal time problem and you've solved the confounding problem, and that's called falsification endpoints. You show me that the people who got two doses and didn't get the booster and the people who got two doses and did get the booster, they have some endpoints that occurred at the exact same rate. For instance, they got in the exact same rate of car accidents, or they died of breast cancer at the exact same rate, because car accidents should have nothing to do with getting a booster, and breast cancer should have nothing to do with getting a booster. So if you show to me that a bunch of endpoints that have nothing to do with getting the booster are balanced, then I'm starting to believe that the endpoints that are imbalanced are due to getting the booster. But they don't show any of this in their analysis. They don't use any falsification endpoints. They don't report all-cause mortality. They don't, they don't report non-COVID mortality. They don't do any of that. And that is despicable from the journal, just, despi just really shitty editorial practice at the journal. The reason being is we've shown over and over Tracy Beth Hogan and myself have a letter in the New England Journal where we call this the healthy vaccine effect. We showed that Israelis who used observational data to prove that the boosters reduce COVID-19 mortality withheld data on non-COVID-19 mortality. The reduction in non-COVID-19 mortality was like 90 plus percent, which is not possible. It can't possibly be true that boosters prevent you from having breast cancer and lung cancer and dying of car accidents, the only way that could be true is if it was given to fundamentally different people, the healthy vaccine bias or effect. We showed that in the New England Journal. These authors, they must know that that's a problem with this data. They're not reporting those kinds of endpoints that would allow us to catch them with residual confounding and time zero problems. So that's, that's the big failure of this. Problem four. Problem four are people like Dr. Vin Gupta legions of white coats who continue to spread misinformation. You know, I suspect from listening to his other comments, which I think I've talked about on this channel, because he said some pretty stupid things about President Biden's mental health. You can go back and watch those videos. That Vin Gupta, he seems to me like an ideologue. He appears on MSNBC, and I might venture guess that he's a passionate Democrat, okay, from the kinds of things he says. And he's so blinded by his ideology that he thinks anybody who doubts vaccine safety, COVID-19 vaccine safety, must be spreading misinformation. Well, here's the reality. Young men were harmed by mandates for COVID-19 vaccinations. We've proved that in a peer-reviewed paper, that the booster doses for young men had a higher risk of myocarditis than that vaccine could ever have prevented hospitalization from COVID-19. That's a clear harm. The rates of myocarditis from this vaccine in young people were horrific. They were ignored by health authorities. They were dismissed. They were not taken seriously. All vaccine safety signals, in my opinion, were not taken seriously by health authorities. The U.S. delayed for one year to space those doses apart like Norway did, which would have reduced myocarditis and preserved efficacy. They did that for no good reason, okay? Vin Gupta 
says, real science published in the world's signature and most prestigious journal. First of all, he doesn't know what nature communications is. It's not, no, it's not, it's not the, the most prestigious medical journal, probably not even in the top 25. It's the shitty knockoff of nature. Okay. Um, so that's not what it is. Okay. And it's not really great science either. It lacks falsification testing. It lacks real robust proof that residual confounding is not occurring. It doesn't really, in my mind, solve the time zero problem. I don't know how they're going to try to do that. Um, it's written very poorly. The tables are a mess. The tables are a complete mess, um, you know, uh, in a number of ways, uh, which I could elaborate on, but I won't because this is a lay audience mostly, and I don't want to get into the technical details about that. Um, but the tables are not clearly presented, and I suspect the peer review process was piss poor. It was done by people who already agreed with the authors about the central conclusion, and so they didn't want to push back. So my overall conclusion is, last point. One thing I found very interesting in this paper is actually that each additional dose has a bigger difference in MI. Like it's more protective to get the booster than the first dose. That to me was interesting because that runs counter to even other shitty observational data that says the first dose had the biggest impact on COVID-19 outcomes and each subsequent dose has a smaller impact. So why does this have the opposite pattern? And I actually wonder what might be happening is two things are going on. There's some confounding. There's some difference in the group of people getting each additional shot. And there's also some actual vaccine harm, like the vaccine's actually increasing the risk of these adverse events. And in the first analysis, unvaccinated versus booster, the confounding is being offset by the vaccine harm, so you get a modest overall benefit. And in subsequent doses, the vaccine harms are getting smaller with each subsequent dose because we've kind of removed the people idiosyncratically prone to being harmed, and the confounding is more apparent, and that's why you're getting a bigger effect size. The way to prove me wrong, this hypothesis, is not, I, I don't believe it to be true. I don't know it to be true. I suspect it might be. The way to prove it wrong would be to release, again, car accident data for one dose, two dose, three dose by unit time, all these metrics of car accident data to show me that these are not confounding groups of people. I need falsification testing. I need all-cause mortality. I need car accident data, something like that. So, you know, the last thing I'd say is, you know, whenever I make these videos, people write in the comments something like, you know, it's a conspiracy. They're trying to force this on you, blah, 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 blah. I'm really reminded of the old phrase, never attribute to malice that which incompetence can explain. I think you all think that the people doing this research are competent. They're not competent. They're very, very dumb often. They don't know basic things. They're not using their brain. Not a day goes by where I don't see somebody with all the greatest degrees on earth say something really really fucking stupid because they're not using their brain. They're not thinking about things. And the moment they get a prior from their political party or their friends, they're really anchored onto the prior. They're not really thinking. So I really think that there's a huge problem in this space that people are not doing good science and they just don't know what they're doing. The next problem, of course, is the bias problem. It doesn't even have to be malice. There's a huge bias in the field, which is that nobody who pushed these vaccines, which are many, many people, want to admit that they harmed populations and that the vaccine mandates were harmful. Those mandates were signed off by Biden and Fauci and all the top brass at uh, the U.S. and other countries. They don't want to admit that they screwed up. So there's this huge pressure in science not to look for vaccine safety signals and certainly not to find them. They want to be downplayed. So that's the, that's the big bias, and that is what I would say the rot of the field is. It's a field that doesn't like to debate and doesn't like real self-correction. Science only self-corrects painfully when they can no longer escape their errors. So Nature Communications paper really doesn't even belong in Nature Communications, which is a mediocre journal. It belongs in the trash can. Uh, it's not Nature, it's the trash can level paper because it doesn't really do all this stuff that a scientific paper should, which is present enough data that the, that the conclusions are robust. I write on my Substack, the study is not trustworthy, I don't trust it, and I really think it belongs in the trash can. People ask me to read papers like this, I get these kinds of emails, and this is my dissection of the paper. The person who asked me to do it has thanked me infectious disease physician. But I really hate reading shitty papers. I like to read randomized trials and at least think about the biases that might be more subtle and more harder problems. This, this nut is quite easy to crack. It's not a great paper. Um, anyway, those are my overall thoughts. The last thing I'd say is I see that there's a few, um, you know, like YouTube accounts where there are people who claim to debunk misinformation or communicate science uh, and then they say, oh, I have a PhD in biology or something like that. Um, but they're unemployed. I mean, they don't actually work as a professor at a university. They don't publish papers. PubMed these people. If you haven't published 10 papers in the last year, 
you know, you you might have been a scientist, but are you still a scientist? I don't know what the hell you are. Um, you're out of the game. And if you're not published more than 100 or 200 papers, and if you're not published like 100 papers in epidemiology or 200 papers in epidemiology, you probably don't know a lot about how to read and dissect and think about papers, which is most people just you know, debunking. It's one thing to have an opinion. I think everyone's entitled to opinion. But if you claim you're debunking someone and you are an idiot, which is what a lot of these people are, then I think it's a problem. Okay, it's a problem. So in other news, ah, Mariana Barossa from Portugal, John Yonides, you all know from Stanford, and I have a paper out. I should do a video on this. I'm going to do this in the future. We have a paper out just now and it is a long paper, the European Journal of Clinical Investigation, showing how we could do more randomized studies for annual COVID boosters, which I would never get one unless there is a randomized study, and the flu shot, actually. All respiratory virus annual vaccines need better data, and we explain what data you could get, how to design the study, what studies to run, and even people who think randomized trials are impossible, they'll have to look at our table of all the studies you could do and concede that many of them would be informative. So this is a really interesting paper. I guess I'll come back and do a whole video on that. And I also want to do a video on all these people saying that like presidential candidates should release medical records. That's something on my to-do list because I think that's really stupid too. All right. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. My last video on driver mutation lung cancer was strangely not so popular. I wonder why. It is a technical talk that was given uh, at UCSF to an oncology audience. Um, why you don't like it? Why you don't like it? Okay. Um, I'll be back. I have a three-hour lecture I gave to some high school students who in many ways were actually better critical thinkers than a lot of professors I know. Um, I hope to edit that and put it out soon. So if you like this channel, subscribe, tell a friend, subscribe to Vinay Prasad's Observations and Thoughts, my Substack, and uh, I'll be back later. Until next time.